So my glasses thing of having multiple glasses actually starts, it predates my relationship with my dear friend, Elton John, who I've done so much with. I mean, I literally sat on his sofa at his house and said, would you write the music to The Lion King? I flew to meet with him. Wow. So I predate, it predates Elton, but he has literally walked up to me and tapped my glasses and told me where, what store in the world I got them in. It's time to welcome on our guest, my favorite by far. Thomas Schumacher. Welcome to 32 Bar Cut, the show. Today we have a very exciting guest. He is the producer of Disney Theatricals, Thomas Schumacher. Welcome to the show. <laughs> I am so excited to be with you, particularly right now after what you've been through this week. It's crazy. It, this this week is so historical. I can't even believe that we that we're here. You know, there's so many talks of, well, we might be able to come back this date or we might be able to come back this date. We're just not sure. So much insecurity with all of it. You know, the world is just something we don't even know anymore. But here we are. We made it to the finish line. You were in the audience. But before oh, yeah. we get into that, before we get into that, the first thing I ask everyone when they come on, how are you? Um, I'm well. I, I've, uh, it's interesting because this is, I've only come back to the States for four days to be here for Lion King. So I've been living in England mostly since wow. June 1st. And I flew over so we could start getting those shows going. And I came back just for Lion King. And then tomorrow I begin the journey back. And then I don't come home to New York, where, which, where I live, until the second week of November. So wow. it's a long time away. June, Essentially June 1st to November 8th or 9th with four days back in the middle. Wow. That is, that is a lot. That is a lot. <laughs> yeah. Your job is so interesting in that I... I I personally, I know you're the producer of Disney theatricals, and I know that you're the face of, of what we do and, and you make things happen, but I don't know what a producer does. What does a producer do and how do they make this thing work for us? Well, it's interesting because it, you're not wrong to not have a sense of the whole thing because our relationship is all about you and the Lion King. And then you also as a member of the Disney theatrical family. So we pull you into other stuff, but that's what you see. Um, I actually, uh, I grew up only wanting to do theater and I started seeing theater at a very young age. I started making theater before I'd ever seen a professional person do theater. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, I grew up in San Francisco and uh, had enormous support around me for the arts, not in my family. No one in my family ever cared about the performing arts. But outside, I started working in the performing arts. And I went to college to be a theater major. And I started working immediately after that. Um, I graduated and I went to work in a theater to train to be a producer. So it's all I've really wanted to do since I hung up my wig on the final performance of Pippin <laughs> in 19, the summer of 1970. Nine at Santa Ro in Santa Rosa at Summer Repertory Theater. So I was doing all these shows in rep, and I put I played Pippin, and I always threatened my friend Stephen Schwartz with, "I'm going to sing for you if you don't, you know, give me my way on this story <laughs> point." But um, anyway, I hung my wig up and said, "I'm going to go be a producer." So what a producer does fundamentally, um, and and it changes whether you're institutionally producing, which is what we do, or independently producing. Um, independent producers on Broadway will encounter a piece of material either because somebody brought it to them or because they went and sought it or because they fundamentally put it together. And then those people have to go raise money and then they put the show on and then they hope it works and they, they then it becomes a business. But I've always worked institutionally. So I grew up in the nonprofit, which always is a surprise to people because something as commercial as Disney, you assume I have a business degree or I, I don't have any of that. I don't have a business degree. I don't have it. no MBA, none of that. Everything I know I learned on the job, except how to make theater, which I learned in school and on the job. My job as an institutional producer is to run a company, Disney Theatrical, which is a big staff. It's like a, like a, like a nonprofit regional theater. There's, you know, we have a publicity department. We have a marketing department. We have a production department. We have a development department. We have an education department. And all of that eventually comes up to me, and I have to represent that inside the Walt Disney Company. I don't have to raise money. I, um, but because we have been so successful at Disney, we haven't had to ask Disney for any money in 
oh, 20 plus years, mostly because Beauty and the Beast started and became very successful. And then Lion King has always created the cash flow by which we could do other stuff. So my job is to make sure that we deliver on the promise to our shareholders that we're making money, to deliver on the promise of our um, aesthetic point of view, that we will, we will always endeavor to surprise, delight, and, and move the needle forward somehow, and that we will be inclusive in our who we make shows with. Um, and then when we are lucky to have a hit, then we take it around the world. And it's our job at Disney Theatrical to, so while you've been waiting to get started and rehearsing, I've been in England, right? And we got Mary Poppins back up at the Prince Edward Theater in London. We got Lion King back up at the Lyceum in London. We got a brand new production of Frozen on its feet at the Theater Royal Drury Lane. We got a brand new production of Beauty and the Beast, which is gorgeous, um, in Bristol, which will tour the UK. And we oversaw a license of bed knobs and broomsticks. So I'm licensing shows. I'm um, literally in the room producing shows. Sometimes I'm under a piece of furniture with a head carpenter saying, how do we shoot smoke out of this? Or I'm in a with, in the box office saying, how do we sell more tickets? It could be any of that. That's a long answer to your short question. Oh no, but that that is a very, that is the thorough answer that I was looking for because um, producers, like you said, do all sorts of things. And, and there's producers that have to raise money. So it's very interesting to hear you say, hey, we don't have to do that anymore. There's other things. There's other ways that I'm used and other ways that I do my job, my role here. But I'm held accountable for the money. Yes. So, <laughs> and you know, because, I mean, I've blown it a couple of times. And when I, <laughs> and when I don't get it right, I am accountable for that. So, for example, say we do a show like, um, well, the two examples, it's only happened twice out of 10 or more shows we've done. Um, with Tarzan and Little Mermaid, neither one of them, they lost money on Broadway. But I went out and found partners, took those shows around the world. Tarzan played over a decade in Germany. It's been seen all over the world, everywhere. Same for Little Mermaid. Um, and they, they, they've, they're all, you know, um, profitable now. So even though they lost money on Broadway, I had to go dig out of that hole, fill it back up with money, yeah. and then move it forward. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, uh, But if you blow it, you, and we're held responsible. And I, I, can't, I can't spend more money every week on a show than it's making. Yeah, because the A, that's irresponsible and B, it violates the precepts of a commercial company. But I imagine, too, you have to take risks, right? In this field, it's it's theater. It can't all be safe. And I, I mean, so 1997, you're <laughs> we're workshopping The Lion King. Uh, you've made the decision that Julie Tamer, she's the director. This is going to be the, the one for this show. What did that feel like? It seems like such a huge risk and so much money to put forward. Did you know it was going to be a hit? No. The thing, the thing that happened is um, in 1990, I was um, asked by the then chairman of Disney Studios, a really smart guy named Jeffrey Katzenberg, who then founded DreamWorks with Steven Spielberg and David Geffen. But, but Jeffrey was then running Disney Studios. And, and I, had, I had produced my first movie for Disney. I'd never made a movie before. And the, the rescuers nobody wanted, down under, down under, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I produced that, and Jeffrey then said, "Let's do something else." And I said, "Okay." And he handed me two things. One was the Nightmare Before Christmas with Tim Burton, mm. and the other one was um, this thing called King of the Beasts, which became The Lion King. And it's a long saga, and that's been talked about a lot. But how that movie got made, but the movie did get made. And while the movie was being made, I stepped away from being the day-to-day -day producer, became the executive producer, because I took over Disney animation development and all the ideas like Pocahontas and Mulan and all those things. And um, then the chairman of the studio, uh, the company rather, Michael Eisner, who ironically, I was just emailing with yesterday. He's been out of Disney for 15 years or something now, but he reached out because he was, he saw Lion King was in the news and he went, how did it go? You know? <laughs> so we were going back and forth, but he came to me and said, we should put Lion King on stage. And I told him it was the worst idea I'd ever heard. Wow. And, and he said, no, no, we should do it. And I said, no, no, we're not going to do that. You can't make it look like the movie. That seems to be the goal around here. And it'll never work. And finally, he did point out that he was my boss and um, <laughs> that, that, that I should go do it. And so I literally went back to my office and flipped through my Rolodex, which is what we did back then because we didn't have a contact file on a computer because we didn't have a computer. And I, I called Julie Taymor at home 
from a number I had from 10 years before when I had tried to work with her before Disney. Wow. And I literally just called her at home and she goes, hi, <laughs> <laughs> how you been? <laughs> and, um, and she really hadn't heard of The Lion King. And by this time, it was the biggest movie in the world at the time. And, but of course, she hadn't heard of it. And, um, but I thought that's a good sign. So we started working on this idea. We workshopped it. And funnily enough, during the pandemic or right before the pandemic, I was cleaning some files and I came across an unmarked video and I didn't know what it was. And I sent it to this company. You can put things in a box and they send you video and in a box and they'll send you back a digital copy. I said, I wonder what was on that video. It was the original workshop to <laughs> The Lion King. Wow. With Keith David as Mufasa, <laughs> oh Mario Cantone as Timon. I can totally I mean, see Keith David as Mufasa. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think he was wondering what that big thing was on his head. But he was. <laughs> like, anyway, we with? had the whole thing. But even Garth demonstrating um, how the how um, the 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 gazelles would work with the, on your head and on the arms, all in cardboard. And we did this workshop. And everyone from the Walt Disney Company, Michael Eisner, Michael Ovitz worked there then, and a man named Joe Roth, who was out of the studio, they didn't get it at all. And they shut it down. So when you ask, was it a risk? Yeah. They, and it was, it was really our fault that they didn't get it. I mean, I, I always tell the story, you know, to be like, how could you miss it? But we had them sitting so close, they didn't understand what they were looking at. The big picture. And mm. when they all drove away and left us at, at um, 890 Broadway, you know, the old rehearsal studio down there, Michael Bennett's old building. Um, when they all drove away, Peter Schneider, who I did the show with originally, and my, my virtual sibling, and Julie Taymor and I were out front saying, well, that didn't go well. <laughs> and Peter wisely said, we have, to, we have to show them the thing in scale. And we flew out to California and we convinced Michael Eiser to come back a couple of months, three months later, and we built three versions of Mufa of Scar. We built three versions of Zazu and three versions of Timon. And then we demonstrated them on the stage of Beauty and the Beast in full light with Michael 15 rows back, Michael Eisner. And he bought into it and we raced to get it done and ran up to Minneapolis. We never got the show to run before we did the first preview. We couldn't, the first two weeks of previews, we couldn't get out of the, we couldn't get into the stampede. Wow. It took, we had to stop the show for like six minutes. Oh. And, and so I would go on stage and do a speech before the show about, we're going to stop and change some scenery, stay in your seats. Yes. I mean, we, we had no idea what we were doing and none of us had ever done a Broadway show before. Wow. So it was a risk, but it was, um, and, and everyone thought it was a terrible idea. And we, we felt there was something there. And then of course, audiences went crazy and um, the rest is, you know, kind of theatrical history. You just, you never know. You never know. And and um, it's interesting, too, because I was going to ask you this. With being an actor, I, I'm i at the mercy, right? I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the will of, of a, a director or a casting director. I'm waiting for the phone to ring. I, I, there's so very little I'm in control of. And I'm curious if that's how you feel sometimes as a producer, that you'll, you present this project and then you're kind of at the mercy of, will this work or not? Well, yeah, first off, let's address the fact that as an actor, the the two biggest things you are in control of is the original yes or no, and then how you are able to fulfill the vision of the people you came to be with. I mean, just imagine for a second. I mean, people that I um that I so love and adore. You know, we lost Sam Wright this year, which is for those of us who knew Sam and worked with him, his extraordinary generosity. He was the most experienced person in that theater. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. He was a star already. He was a he was a grown man wearing this thing on his head. And I remember um like walking up to him, you know, I walked house left down the, the aisle in Minneapolis and he was on stage for the longest time. Um rehearsing. Um and it was the scene after um, They Live in You when he does that sort of lotus pose and little Simba does it, which is among my like top 10 favorite things in The Lion King. And it makes me, whenever it's perfectly timed out just right with the lights and the kid doing everything and putting the, the headdress back on him, I 
I always burst into tears. And I said, Sam, I'm so sorry it's taking this long. And he said, look at me. I'm playing a king. Yeah. And he meant everything about being a black man playing a king, about a show filled filled with black people, but he's not playing a role dependent on race. It was a whole lot of that stuff, as you know. We can get into that later if you want. But yeah. And the leap of faith Sam took with Julie. And then let's go to the other side of the equation. It's no secret. Everyone knows that I'm very close to and adore Heather Headley. And <laughs> we've worked together a lot. And she created the role of Nala. She was Audra's understudy in um, Ragtime in Canada when we cast her. And she had left um, Northwestern. She left college to right. go be with, to cover for Audra. And then we cast her. And Audra's the one who said, Heather, you have to go do this. So here we have Sam Wright and Heather Headley. One very experienced, been the lead in many shows, Pippin, and of course, Tap Dance Kid and all this stuff. And then here's Heather Headley, like never actually is Broadway debut, having to create a character that has five lines in the movie, basically. And, and each one of them had faith in the process and did everything they could do to fulfill the yes, mm -hmm. the yes to do it. Now, how do the yes has to be, how do I do it? So th that's a, that's a lot of control and a lot of faith. Producers, interestingly, have a lot of control because if you, at least the way I do it or we do it, I pick everybody, right? So I went to Julie Taymor and then Julie Taymor came to me and said, okay, what about, we had, actually had a different designer before Richard Hudson. And then that designer didn't want to do it. And Julie, it didn't work. So then we went to Richard Hudson and Julie came to me and said, what about Garth Fagan? And I said, interestingly, the same festival I wanted to work with you on, I was trying to work with Garth on. So I've known his work forever. I would love to work with Garth. Um, Lebo, I already knew, right. Cause we'd already made the movie together right. and we, and we became very close during that. Not every people know that too. I mean, we're very close to Lebo and we became very close during that. So we had a lot, there were, it was just bringing together this group, Mark Mancina, who worked so much on the music um, and probably is not really even known for it, but wrote a lot of these songs, as you know, and um, we all knew each other. And then we were adding Julie, who I didn't know. And so there's the picking people part. And then there's the having faith in process because you have to submit you have to submit to other people's visions. And then, then you, in a sense, become a version of an editor. Mm. You're the If, I think, you do this right, you become a partner with each person to the degree that they're comfortable doing that, to say, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Um, Julie Taymor is an artist of extraordinary power and depth. But there's a whole lot of stuff that's not on that stage that she created or thought about. Mm -hmm. And it's not there because either we looked at it and said that won't fit, whether it's fit artistically, fit physically. And you have to be there for them, but also be willing to say, you know, this moment's not going to work. Yeah. And if you have that relationship, um, and Julie and I, it was funny, we reenacted it all um, when we were doing Lion King in Shanghai because we were doing it in Mandarin. And, but with our component of South African actors who all had to learn Mandarin and, um, which is something that's a lot. Um, <laughs> that's a lot. And we were there and I was sitting with her at the director's table and she goes, how did we originally stage this moment? Cause it's not working. <laughs> and so we were just back in it again. And I think when people are of that extraordinary talent, you have to submit to it, but not give up everything to it. Yes. Yes. I, I think that word you use editing is 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 key. It makes sense, you know. Um they put it all together, they do, you know, make it make it magical, but then you give it more nuance and just take things out that need to be taken out so that it really works. And that is sustainable because honestly, The Lion King is such a a, a monster of a show that uh I could imagine you know, if it was in, in Julie's original vision, you could probably do it one night and then everyone is broken and done and like passed out somewhere. Well, she's she's a genius and I, I just adore her without limit. But we all have we all need someone to say, I get that. But and, mm -hmm. and, and she's fantastic with that. 
she, um, I, you know, anyone who says otherwise simply hasn't worked with her. She's fantastic about partnering and coming together and saying, these are my ideas. And, mm-hmm. um, and there was a lot of sharing of ideas. And, and in the beginning, you know, the show you're doing is like 12 minutes shorter than the show we opened with on Broadway. Yes. Yeah. I have heard on the that. 10th, on the 10th yeah. anniversary, we, we, we cut on 10th anniversary, we cut, um, quite a bit because it was, it was long, you know, and we never had a chance to fine tune it. And, mm. um, and th- you know, there's so many people who have been part of the history of this, Michelle Steckler, who was with us from the very beginning as Julie's associate director and, and then, then became the associate producer, Aubrey Lynch. I don't know if you know Aubrey, but Aubrey was yeah. the last dancer cast by Alvin Ailey for the Alvin Ailey company. He was a company member, became choreographer. Then he became dance supervisor. Then he became associate producer, did 10 companies around the world. And now he has a big fancy job at ABT, but <laughs> But um, it's it's funny because now, you know, somehow I was a lot older than Aubrey when we did it. And somehow our ages have sort of merged as you get older. <laughs> and he's a frequent guest in my house. We spend a lot of time together. And, I and feel like now we just talk. Yeah, Aging he's, in reverse or something. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's deeply younger. irritating. <laughs> <laughs> that's deeply irritating <laughs> for all of us. Yeah. It's um OK. So we haven't talked about this yet, but. You were in the audience of our our first performance back. What was that experience like for you? Well, of course, when you have a special performance like that, like a first night back, um, I was filled with a lot of emotion because I'm surrounded by, because Garth was there and Aubrey was sitting, he was in my group sitting two seats away from me over lunch. And, and, and my husband was with me and, you know, he lived through the entire, it was his idea that the movie had songs. I mean, mm. so, I mean, we're about to celebrate our 40th anniversary. So he's been through it all, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, to be with, and I was sitting right behind Julie with my hands on her shoulders and, you know, it was, and, 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 and her, her other half, Elliot Goldman was there. So, you know, it was all of us together. And, so that was deeply moving. And Lebo was right there. So we were all together. So that's moving. But then, I, I, you know, I've been, as we've been opening the shows, I'd already been through this in London with the company there, which opened two years after um, Broadway. Um, so I, I knew kind of what it was going to feel like from an audience perspective. But then in the American context, for me, I couldn't help but look at that stage and know the stories of so many people who I wouldn't out here. That's for them to tell their stories. But you know, we had company members who went through serious trauma. Mm -hmm. We had company members in South Africa who weren't sure they were ever going to get out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. We had people who really struggled and were hurt and were damaged and, 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 um, and suffered a great deal during the pandemic. And to pretend that didn't happen is to deny the truth of why theater is powerful. So I'm watching a stage knowing so many personal stories. I know the people on that stage who um, were um, fine, right? We have friends in the show, principal actors in the show who, you know, turn their house into a studio, make it happen, do it, do the job, move forward. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And we have other people who literally thought they weren't going to ever breathe again, let alone sing so gloriously. Mm -hmm. We have people like Brandon who are brand new coming in. Like, this is my chance, right? That's, that's its own story. Um, we have people who really went through, and we had people up there who were very frightened. And that also includes people backstage who I've known forever. Um, and I, I have to own that, right? I want everyone to be safe, which is why I'm so happy about the New York mandates for everyone's vaccinated and we're going to take care of people and we're going to test all the time and we're going to do all this. Because I want everyone, the crew, the orchestra. I mean, Dave, who plays the flute in The Lion King, I mean, he, he's been with us since, he's been with us since the beginning, yes. right? I mean, the, and, and everybody is bringing their own truth to it. And I can't pretend that didn't happen. We had a case, you were, um, you were probably on a call when an actor in The Lion King, who I've known for many, 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 many years, um, and, and she and I see each other outside of the show and she goes to events with me all the time and I love her. And she like spoke up about hair, mm-hmm. right? Things that the audience isn't thinking about, but things mm-hmm. that they, uh, which was, and, and uh, there is great respect and affection between the two of us, but she was willing 
to be so candid with me. I could not think about that while I was watching her. And you know what I mean? And, and, yeah. and I adore her. And there she was just beaming and glowing and being unbelievably funny and brilliant in the show and watching her in the curtain call. I literally burst into tears. And I told her this afterwards because all those stories that people don't think matter, mm-hmm. matter enormously, the triumphs, the failures, the fear, the everything, the, the, the seeking um, a better work environment, all of this together. So when I'm looking at the show and I always say this, it's always about people to me. Yeah. But it is about the people to me, right? Mm-hmm. You're playing animals, but it's about the people. And I and there is no Lion King without without those people backstage who get you dressed, get your wig on you, get that costume on you, get the makeup on you, who change you know, you don't have to change your clothes a lot during the show. Other people have some 20 changes during yes. the show. Yes. These people are all the life force of the show, on stage and off stage. And because I've been around it so long and was there when we invented it. I know, right? You know, when we do that stampede, I know what the female dancing wildebeests wore in the very beginning that we had to alter because they were all just breathing raffia. I know what those costumes weighed before we redesigned them. Mm -hmm. I know, right? So um, that doesn't mean I I know their individual experiences. I only know what they can share with me. But yeah. it does mean that I have to react to it. So I'm seeing all of that when the show happens. That's a, that's such a rich experience because you know it so intimately. You can't just watch it. You're, it's almost as if you're on stage with us experiencing it because you know everyone so intimately and you know the history of the show and what's going on backstage. I think because the audience, they see the show, but unless they have some sort of history or uh, relationship with theater, I don't think they they give a second thought about dressers or puppets or makeup or what goes on backstage. But there's so much happening. So much. I think that. Yes. But I think that they may not know it, but they feel it. Ah. And, you know, and I'll give you two examples. One is obviously, you know, those of us who were there in the very, very, very beginning and who watched this young man, Jason Ray's invent the character of Simba. Right. So different than what the character had been in the movie. And, you know, his endless night his you know, just it, you know, it's a it's a heartbreaking story. And many of us stood by him and tried to help him navigate a life that he couldn't mm-hmm. navigate. Right. So that that ended, you know, so horribly. And but I can't help but think about that. Right. So, yes, the audience doesn't know what that is. The people who have been you know, all that they can't possibly know that. But let me give you an example. Everybody I know, and you may know this about me, I, I spend a great deal of time in Italy and I, um, and I love classical art and I study it and, and, and I care about it. And everybody I know tells me when they walk in and look at Michelangelo's David for the first time, how they cry. They just, and it's inexplicable because they've seen scaled copies everywhere. Things exactly the same size, looks exactly the same. There are casts of it in plaster in, in London and stuff. But somehow seeing it, they don't know how that happened. They don't know how this block of marble was brought in from Carrera to, to Florence. They don't know that it had these weird seams in it, that no one wanted to work with it. They don't know that... Michelangelo wanted to make this triumphant figure of David as a symbol of Tuscany, of, 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 of defending itself against marauders. They don't know how he drew it and then chipped away and drilled. He doesn't, they don't know that someone had to rub it with wet straw to get that because there was no such thing as sandpaper. And mm. they don't know any of that. And yet they feel it. And there's no question for me that the audience, and Julie will tell you this, the audience doesn't look at every one of those beads on your corset. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we donated some of those corsets and costumes to the Victoria and Albert Museum in, in, in London because they are art. And, but when we donated them, I asked the lady who did all the beading in London to be with us when we did it because people don't know who she is. They don't know how she beads it. They don't know what those beads are. And you know, because you have an intimate relationship with that costume. 
the intricacy and the beauty of it. But I agree with Julie. They feel it. They don't know it, but they somehow feel it. That the hand of the artist, whether it's the person who made the stuff you're wearing or you, mm-hmm. right? When, when you're, they don't know what Giza Boyabo means. Yeah. They don't know, but they feel, but they feel it. it. Yes. They yes. feel it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I um I want to circle back a bit because you you t- you mentioned our chats the chats we had uh, over Zoom during the break for those of you watching we had chats with our producers over the break and it really came about after the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor uh, deaths and and the the protests around that and I guess the rise or reemergence of acknowledgement of police brutality, but also uh, microaggressions at work and injustices and discrimination at work and and how to navigate through that. And so you and Anne asked us if we would like to meet and talk about this. And so I want to hear from you about uh, what Disney Theatricals is doing to uh, to fashion a better world for us and, and, and make this all happen in a way that protects everyone at work. So, well, it's an appropriate question, and it, and it shifts slightly between companies of shows. As mm. you know, um, our, if you if you just assemble all of our shows together, going all the way back, we employ, well, I think everyone else has come up with a statistic. I don't know that it's true, but we certainly employ more people of color than any other individual producer on shows of this scale, whether it's shows obviously like Lion King or even Aladdin, but even how we've chosen to produce Frozen. Right. Mm-hmm. That that there's a there's a consciousness about those choices. So that brings with it a responsibility. And it's very different if you're touring in The Lion King. Right. And so, for example, in the calls with um, the tour, you know, the t- there have been many tours of The Lion King out. But there was a big shift when we we had played every major city in America five times. Mm. So we couldn't go back anymore. So we said, what if we fashioned a smaller, slightly smaller version that would, that would look very big in a small town, you know? But the thing that we didn't pay attention to was, and I, this is not, there's, I'm just, I, there's no excuse for this failure other than, um, and it's not an excuse, it's a real ignorance. A blind or an, spot. A, a whole, oh. Yeah, a blind spot, mm-hmm. if you will, because it didn't, it just didn't occur to me the world in some places can be as terrible as it is. And Mm -hmm. so we sent a tour out playing small towns and I don't think provided enough security and support Mm -hmm. for the company. And we were in towns that just weren't used to a group arriving with their New York pride their I'm part of the Lion King. I just operate freely here. And we did not, um, step up because we didn't, we, it just, we just didn't know. And people really raised that from the tours. And so to that end, we now travel with security for the company. Mm. Like that's, and I use that as an example of something really overt, Mm -hmm. right? Um, That we now have security people who are with the company. They strategize as we go into different cities. They work with local law enforcement. Please understand we're bringing this, the most respected company of people you can bring into your town. This is what we're going to expect from you for the venues and also for the artists in the show, how we're going to, how we're going to be there for you. Does that erase um, uh, every problem that we could encounter? No, but it means that we're getting ahead of it. Yeah. So that's, that's a very practical thing. Another practical thing that grew out of these conversations, and we referenced it um, uh, before is something that for particularly for, non-black members of your audience, it would never occur to them, probably, prior to all of this, the the challenges and demands and needs for Afro-textured hair. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't, and by the way, there are a whole lot of ladies on Broadway who have hair issues from having their hair in pin curls every night, what we call wig prep. Mm -hmm. Um, Because every night, but how do we manage hair? Mm-hmm. And so um, because it's about the prep of the hair, the taking care of the hair, management of hair, building, in our case, puppets and masks that can accommodate hair. How do we do it? 
And also, equally importantly, what do we tell people when they audition? Mm -hmm. What are you told before you get cast and then told, oh, you're going to have to cut that hair off because you've got dreads that go all the way down your back or you've got extensions or you've got this or that. You need to know if you would like to be in the show, there are certain things that are going to work. And bright blue 38-inch extensions going down your back are not going to work in The Lion King. So we have to figure out how to manage the process with respect and dignity and, and, and honesty and, and being direct. Mm -hmm. And so to that end, we brought in a bunch of consultants who've worked with our hair and makeup team to talk about how to manage hair, how to take care of hair, how to be respectful of hair, how to recognize that hair can be sacred for people. And, and we've, and I've taken workshops in that um, because I think that if, unless you're told, and you know, and even the, and the hair and the makeup union has participated with us at Disney in this because they don't have the information either, mm -hmm. which I'm, I have found fascinating. And in our own industry, the backstage hair and makeup people are not as experienced, in fact, as some elements of television and film, because I don't know why. I have no excuse for that. And the, the level of complexity had never been presented to me as directly as it was. And so I've taken, we've taken great action on that. And then there's issues... By the way, you're welcome to ask me anything you want. But but there's issues in terms of text and content within mm. scenes. And there are issues about how those scenes are directed and or taught. Oh, I see. That, yes, yes. And that we need to be respectful of. Because um, I think sometimes people who are as resident directors, associate directors, people who are working with the company, may be so far removed from how... That, that the scene was originally created with a set of actors, mm -hmm. they might be using a shorthand that is um, either inaccurate or disrespectful or just completely inappropriate. And we have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. How we can talk about the scene. In some cases, there's dialogue on some of our shows that might have been okay when a film was animated, or but when it's a theatrical experience and you're looking at actors, there's dialogue that needs to be debated. And by the way, everyone does not agree and, it's, and it doesn't divide with one group agrees and one group doesn't, because even within playing the same parts or how they're acted or how they're spoken about. But we need a, a much, much higher awareness of how we come to that scene with the respect we bring into that scene and recognizing the lived experience of the person who's going to be playing that part yeah. and how are they taught the role and how do they respond to it. That's just scratching the surface of things that I learned in those discussions. Yeah, and I know it's... What was amazing about that for me, from my perspective, is that when you, for me, when I booked The Lion King, my life changed, right? So I'm just excited to be a part of the cast. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to say anything that's going to upset anyone. I'm good. I'm good. You know, and I think that most actors feel that way. When they get a wonderful opportunity, you don't want to be the squeaky wheel. But when we had those meetings and we were able to really talk freely about different ways we were feeling, uh, it, it, it opened doors. And I think it all made us feel closer and able to really access you and Anne in a way that would benefit everyone. And, and when, when we are gone and new, newer people come into the cast, it will benefit them as well. And when you put up another production for Disney theatricals, they'll be benefited by these talks. And so even though it's uh, icky and difficult in the moment, it all works out. I mean, we did try to make them as, um, we tried to reduce the ick as much as possible, but, but when there's something icky to be talked about, you can't run away from it. And, and we keep referencing Anne, Anne Court is, um, co-producer of Lion King. She's been with Disney Theatrical for a very long time. She grew up in the theater. She was an actress at Stratford when she was young. She is um, such a trusted and close ally and she cares about the Lion King so much and so deeply knows it. And this, um, and we've had to sort of divide and conquer all these territories around the world as we split up. So like I'm heading, I'll be in Holland this week. I'll be in Liverpool and Holland this coming week, one on wow. beauty <laughs> and, and then on a new Aladdin in Holland. And she's going to be with the Aladdin company here and then manage it. So, you know, we divide up But Anne Court and I wanted to do those meetings without someone between us and the company. Mm. And it was important, but it's also important. And that's why I was so grateful to particularly either long-term ensemble members or who felt feel more comfortable or long-term principals 
and the show just speaking up Mm -hmm. because it gives, it lets everyone else know that you have to be able to do that. Now there are certain things that are never going to change, you know, in the Broadway context, we do eight a week. The entire economy of Broadway is built on eight performances a week. Maybe someday someone will change that, but that's going to change the economy of how it works. Mm -hmm. There are things that are not going to change. Like when you're in the ensemble of a show, you're playing the part as directed, as designed, and as it's always been, and you're doing the choreography as it's been created and as hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have done it around the world. A lot of these things are not going to change Mm -hmm. because it's a show that you want to know whenever you see it, you're seeing that version, Mm -hmm. right? And that there's no question, you know, L. Steven... Taylor, who is so great as Mufasa, <laughs> he's so breathtaking. But Elsevier plays it very different than Sam Wright because there are different points in their life, right? Mm-hmm. Elsevier was a new dad when he started playing it, you know, and and Sam was a you know a, a, a man, you yeah. know, <laughs> and you know an old guy, you know, and so it was he's still a warrior. But of course, they're going to bring their own truth to it. And as you see the show, people do bring, you know, your Nala is very different than Heather's is very different than, you know, I've, I've seen so many Nala's that, yeah. And, and some Nala's you never have to see again, <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> but, but um, you know, certain territories, but you're, what you're going to bring to it is very different when you are singing Shadowland. It's very different than watching um, someone sing it in Mandarin or someone sing it in Japanese and what their own sense of nationalism is and who, how they exist and what battle they had to face to get there. So, of course, within the principal things, things are going to change, but odd things should change and shift between actors. But the show itself, there are obligations to the show that aren't going to change. We can make it appropriate, comfortable as we can, but those things are fixed. Other things, we have to change and stay with it. And if I'm going to take 12 minutes out on the 10th anniversary... And then someone says to me, you know, these four lines of dialogue actually make me very uncomfortable. Mm. Then we're going to change it. Yeah. And, you know, I'm working on a revival um, of Aida right now. You know, the musical that we did right after Lion King. And um, it's this is an interesting example because we're reinvestigating. David Henry Wong wrote the book to Lion to to Aida. Elton John and Tim Rice famously wrote the music and won a Tony Award for it. And the songs are great. And. You know, my beloved Heather Headley played um, uh, Aida. And yet the director of the show is Shelley Williams, who was in the original production and played Nehebka and eventually covered um, Aida. So as we work on that, there's stuff in that show. It's go- going to truly be a revisal, not just a revival, because now looking at this context, I I go I both with the agency of Aida, certain actions she takes or does not take certain language that she uses, certain words that are said to and in front of other characters have a different resonance. Are they different now for our time? And they need to change. Mm-hmm. And I'm completely, that's why I picked Shelley. I'm completely comfortable with that. And we have very frank conversations about it. And that's where we need to be. Now, does, does the audience need to know that? No. Does the audience, is that part of the advertising? No. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's our job. Right. That's our job together Yeah, to to work this stuff out and and to find it and to present Um, it in that way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, So we you talked a bit about uh, with these conversations, um, you're in the Broadway League and have been you've chaired on the Broadway League. And so I imagine that you all saw each other a lot (laughs) during the past (laughs) 18 months. So how did you all come to the decision that it's time and that it's safe. And, and what has the past 18 months been like for you and for the Broadway League? Well, it was very challenging. Um, when the pandemic, when we first became aware of the pandemic, that it was really going to hit, I was actually abroad. I was in Italy um, in my other life, <laughs> producing a giant benefit um, um, uh, during Carnivale in Venice, featuring... Uh, my pal Ashley Brown, from oh. who, of course, was right out of college in a tour we did called On the Record. And then she was the 15th Bell. And of course, she was the original Mary Poppins. Yes. So I was with Ashley doing this giant benefit. And we raised a lot of money that night. And then they said, get out of town. We're closing Carnivale. There's a pandemic. Wow. <laughs> and we raced out, leaving bobby pins and wigs flying. You know, <laughs> And um, it was Carnivale. 
And I came back to America and it was clear. I raced off to Mexico to cast Aladdin thinking, how bad is this really going to be? I get back to New York and it's, we have to start having meetings. And we began, I was chairman of the Broadway league. And so I began to have meetings with um, officials, um, uh, all the different sort of groups or cohorts on Broadway theater owners, um, theater um, uh, uh, physical plant managers, eventually with all the producers. And I was meeting with all the producers of the shows that were running or in rehearsal. And that was on Thursday, the 12th of March. And that's when we all said we have to shut this down. And we had Governor Cuomo on the phone in the other room going back and forth. And that night we shut it down. Within a few days of that, and we all thought we were taking a break for two, three weeks and we'd be back up. And it was so shocking that this would happen. Mm -hmm. And very soon, actually outside of the league, a group of producers began to meet. And they included um, David Stone of Wicked, um, Jeffrey Seller of Hamilton, um, Scott Rudin was on the was on these calls, um, Sue Frost was on these calls, Maggie Braun, all these people from a select group of Broadway shows. And they began to meet, invited me to meet. And I said, well, I can't really meet with you, even though we have a lot in common, because I I'm the chairman of the league. So that committee became part of, if you will, the league. And I, the thing I remember so distinctly was, and by the way, we all knew each other really well before we were meeting. So we could speak really honestly. We were just speaking for ourselves about what our own needs were, what we were experiencing, what our actors and companies were experiencing. And Jeffrey Sellers said, this would have been sometime fourth week of April, said, guys, I think this could go on until the 4th of July. He'd been on with Fauci. And I said, we were all like, what? That could, and that was 4th of July, 2020. 2020, right. <laughs> oh my God. And we were in shock. And it was, what was became interesting to me was a group of people who were perceived to compete with each other became profoundly cooperative. And it was really those of us who had high visibility shows um, that were able to command attention of government. So we began meeting, we got lobbyists, we got, we arranged for SVOG funding. We lobbied for extension of um, uh, benefits for unemployment. We lobbied for a lot of things and we were trying to navigate with the unions, how we were going to do this. What if we did this? What if we did that? And there was a whole lot of process involved there. But I think something that came out of it, if you flip all the way to the end is what happened this week. It was a massive national news story that Broadway was back. Huge. Right? You've been on Nightline. <laughs> you've been on the Today Show. You've been on Good Morning America. Um, Good Morning America. World News. I just, yeah. I can't believe it. You've been everywhere. <laughs> and that's because Lion King, Wicked, and Hamilton said we're the most visible shows. It's not about who's best or anything. It's just, it's just about we're the most visible. And if we unite mm -hmm. and we coordinate our opening night, mm -hmm. we can, we know that that becomes a news story. Mm -hmm. And the publicity teams on each of those shows did an amazing job yes. of taking what are perceived as competitors. We celebrated each other's shows, right? We had Julie Taymor with Stephen Schwartz, with Lynn Mamo Miranda out doing all this publicity beforehand. Then each of them came back to their own theaters and spoke to the audience, you know, which was great. Kristen Chenoweth actually was did the pre-show talk at <laughs> Wicked and then came to she sat right behind me and we were joking because she came to see Lion King. And that the camaraderie about let's do this together has made it a national news story that's much bigger than any one of us individually. And that's, you know, you know, I'm reminded of Lucy Van Pelt and your good man, Charlie Brown. These five fingers individually are nothing, but when I joined them together, they became a fighting force terrible to behold. And <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's Lucy Van Pelt. And I just think that there's something about that that spins out of this year of trauma. We on the league side and the individual show side didn't stop working. My days began every day getting on Zoom calls at 9 a.m. I would take an hour off for lunch and I didn't get off until six or seven every night. And then the weekends were usually conference calls. And it went that way for the entire pandemic. Wow. And we didn't see each other. And get this, at The Lion King that night, um, this last week, 
two people in particular, I won't name them because, but you'll see them soon on a 60 minutes thing. Cause there's, there, there's a safety protocol that we were, we've been trying to do. And the, by the way, the governor, the guy in the governor's office gave us the NYU school of public health to help us with advising us when it would be safe to answer your question. We had lots of advisors, lots of people I have met with for over a year with people I've never seen in person. And I invited them to come to the Lion King. <laughs> These like amazing people, you know, Jack Caravanos, who's this industrial hygienist, who's a genius, um, who works at the NYU school of public health. I've met with him so much on, on zoom calls that and I said, Jack, you have to come to Lion King. You've been helping us understand how we could come back and guiding us through this process. He said, I'll be there with my wife. And he was sitting in my row and he walked up to me and I said, you're so tall. <laughs> because I had actually never even seen him not sitting. You know, we became friends over this. We would get on the thing earlier and talk about our lives. And I'd watch him on YouTube clips and he'd watch me on YouTube clips. And, and, and we realized so many people that we had grown this network with mm -hmm. were coming together. And by the way, it wasn't just with them. It was within theaters, you know, it, particularly in the first year of the pandemic, when there were so many questions, my dear friend, Colleen Jennings Rogensock, who runs the Gamage in Arizona, and we've been friends for lots of reasons, the league and also Jason C's Arizona and lots of stuff, but she was way ahead on testing protocols. So then she was introducing me because she runs a performing arts center in a university, how to manage group testing. I mean, we were all calling on each other for everything during it to figure out how to get you safely back in the theater. That is incredible. I mean, and it, and it's paid off because now we've had this amazing reopening and it's, we're back. We're back. I've, I've I've been so thrilled to be a part of this this historic moment, and I don't want to hold you too long because it's almost our our time is up. And I know you're a very very busy person, but I can't let you leave without asking you two questions. Go ahead. One is a simple one, and then one is just a bit of advice for the folks listening. So, you have a signature look. Your glasses. Everywhere, every time I see you, you have a really cool pair of glasses. When did that start? And how many pairs of glasses do you have? Well, I actually, I thought this might come up because <laughs> I'm just traveling for the weekend. I have one, two, three, four, five pair plus that are on me sitting on my desk right now. <laughs> um, so I do have a lot of glasses, but there's a good thing when you get to be my age, right? I'm in my 60s, for God's sakes, which I never thought would happen. But when you're my age, your glass, your eye prescription doesn't change so much. Mm. So I can wear glasses that I've had for a long time. It actually started, I realized I needed glasses very early. I, I, I should have had glasses much earlier. I didn't get them until I was out of college, which might explain why I had crazy migraines all through college. Mm. But, you know, this is the 70s. People didn't know better. And um, I know I got glasses. Ironically, I got glasses. And the first day I was wearing them, I'm not kidding. I was driving the legendary director, Peter Brook, around Los Angeles, looking for a location to produce um, the Mahabharata, this nine hour epic play that he had created. You know, he's a famous man. I, I grew up admiring Peter Brook, this great director of Shakespeare and everything. And and it's my first day spending real time. We'd spent a lot of time together getting ready for this. We were doing site visits to find a place to do this massive production. Um, <laughs> and I had picked up my glasses the day before and it was the first day I was wearing them. And he said to me, nice glasses. <laughs> and I thought, oh, so my glasses thing of having multiple glasses actually starts, it predates my relationship with my dear friend, Elton John, who I've done so much with. I mean, I literally sat on his sofa at his house and said, would you write the music to the Lion King? I flew to meet with him. Wow. So I predate, it predates Elton but he has literally walked up to me and tapped my glasses and told me where, what store in the world I got them in. Yes. Right. So that's funny. <laughs> okay. That's the glasses thing. What was the other one? The other question, the final question is for anyone watching or listening who is interested in doing what you do or any realm of what you do, what advice do you have to offer? And I know that's a big question, so you can pick one thing. Well, I think that our business is one of the few businesses left that is truly about apprenticeship, mm. mentorship, and sponsorship. And they're each three different things, right? Apprenticeship is you sit at the foot of a master and you watch them do it. You know, they're carving a statue and they have you carve a spoon. <laughs> and then you learn how to carve and they keep telling you that's apprenticeship and we need to apprentice and we need to just accept there are people who know a lot more than we do. And to study with them doesn't mean we're going to replicate their work, but we're going to learn from them. 
And I was able to apprentice with some of the giant theater makers of the 20th century. And that's something that I will never forget. Um, that, that I got to be, I literally was doing a, a, a talk back with an audience at the um, uh, Center Theater Group in Los, part of the Music Center in LA. We were doing Aida out there way back when. Um, Simone was playing Aida and this really lovely tour. And they, because I was, you know, local kid makes good. They, and I, the Tony worked for Lincoln. So they invited me to come talk to a group. And I had 200 parents and their teenage kids in a rehearsal room at the Mark Taper Forum in LA. And I, when I started, I said, thank you very much for coming. A little applied applause. I have a lot I want to share with you, but I would like everyone in the room to please stand up. Um, and they all did. I said, I need you now to spread your, your feet 18 inches. Now they're all like, Whoa. and I, they did. And I said, I want you to look at this floor. And they all did. They looked at me and I said, my first job here was sweeping this floor. So the actors would be safe when they came in the room every day. <laughs> I had more moms afterwards thank me for telling their kids that yeah. apprenticeship and being in the room, taking notes for, for directors, all that is so huge. That's the first piece of it, apprenticeship. And then really understanding that you need to find mentors, people who will um, let you into the room, people who will. So when we did um, Aladdin, which is, God bless it, a big old hit all over the world. We needed Aladdin, the second production. We did, a, we did an experimental production in Seattle, but the real pre-Broadway was in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, James was in, James Michael was in, you know, it was the company, as you know them. Um, and that was that big pre-Broadway thing. And the legendary Manny Eisenberg, one of the greatest producers of the last half of the, certainly the 20th century. And, and you know, Manny had like, you know, um, seven productions that he was personally the lead producer on running at the same time. Right. He, I mean, he was, he was huge, you know, and, um, and I'd grown up knowing about Manny, watching Manny. He was a big figure in my youth at the center theater group, but, and then on Broadway, when I had my first show, he like literally my first meeting of the Tony administration committee 25 years ago, or whatever he literally said, come sit by me. And it was guiding me through how Tony administration works, who all the producers are, how the whole, I mean, he was sensational. And so he flew to Toronto and he saw Aladdin and the show wasn't working yet. And he walked up to me and, you know, I respect him so much. And I love him so much. And, and we know each other so well. And he walked up to me and he, he put his hands on my shoulders and he said, you know, I love you. And you know, when someone says, you know, I love you, something bad's going to come. Yeah. <laughs> but he, he said, you know, I love you. Um, and he says, and I think there's a hit here, but, and then he laid out what he thought wasn't working. And he said, want to have a drink? And we sat up with Ann Court um, for several hours um, next door at a bar. And we went through everything. And the next day, Casey Nicholas said, what did Manny say? And I told him what Manny said. Casey Nicholas, of course, a and director of Aladdin. And, and, I, and, I, and, and Manny wasn't proscriptive. He just said what wasn't making sense to him. And I shared that with Casey. And a day later, two days later, Casey came back and said, I have a big idea for a rethink. We're going to have James open the show. He'll be the first thing you see. We're going to change this to this. He laid it all out. We all agreed on it. We began a rewrite while the company was up there. We gave them the rewrites when we left town and we opened on Broadway with a show that was structured differently because I had a mentor who, who knew me and who I trusted and who trusted me, who was there for me. And also sponsorship, people who see something in you that they want to help and they actually get you jobs. Yeah. And I had that in a professor from UCLA named John Cobble, for whom I've named an award that I give away at the American College Theater Festival to um, uh, to young producers from underrepresented communities, and I've named it after him because he's the one who said to me, "This is where you need to go." And then he called me and said, "Now you need to go work for a nonprofit." So I want you to go take this job at the Los Angeles Ballet. Now you need to do this. I mean, he was he was there for me in a way that so apprenticeship, sponsorship, uh, 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 mentorship, and you need to be able to find that. And you need to find people like me who are adjunct professors and volunteer organizations, but also write us letters. You know, I got a letter when we were going to um, Toronto from a young producer, sensational letter. He said, I've watched these five things of you online. This is the thing I noticed that's a thread in these speeches. I watched your TED talk and I would like 30 minutes with you when you come to Toronto. And I said, great. 
I went to Toronto. He came to sit in the theater while I was doing, we were doing the load in. I just came for the day. And we ended up hiring him as a PA. He then worked with us um, in the UK on Shakespeare in Love. He then oversaw our production of Aladdin there. And he now is a real hotshot um, and is actually in the middle of, um, he's the, the on the ground producer of a really major Broadway show that he's putting up right now. And, you know, uh, and I'm so grateful to him. And they eventually become smarter than you are, which is the benefit, right? And so I think people watching, you just need to have, it doesn't, you don't lose yourself when you let other people get involved in helping you. You actually grow yourself. Yes. That's my advice to them. Oh my gosh. Tom, that was really, really insightful. And I, I believe anyone watching and listening is going to benefit from that. Thank you so much for doing this, for coming on to the show, for chatting with us during this big week. And I know you have a lot going on too and you're traveling, so safe travels to you. And thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. You're really good at this. I've enjoyed watching the show. So you're really good at this. So thank you. I really, and, and by the way, just on behalf of the Lion King, thank you so much. You really put yourself out there for the last couple of weeks, getting the show ready and doing so much beautiful representation of our show. You're, you're, you're just sensational. So thank you. And I really feel lucky I got to spend time with you today, even though it wasn't as private as it feels like right now. I know now. it does. I know it feels so <laughs> private and then we're just going to put it on the internet and everyone's going to see. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. it's been so lovely. This is, this is so great. I feel like we sat down and had coffee. So thank you so much. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. 